So great to have you on our show today. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, looking at your work and following your work for the last couple of years, and it has been incredible to see um, what someone who is passionate about trying to be, make a difference is able to do. Um, you know, taking stuff from idea to you know manifestation, and I think it will be really great for our viewers to get to know you better and to see what it looks like um, from the inside, uh, creating a life that is about service to others, but also trying to find that balance, you know? And so, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the show. How are you Thank going? Thank you very there? much. Yeah, trying is the key word there. I've yeah, definitely man. not found that balance quite yet, <laughs> but we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if you could tell um, everyone a little bit about yourself and the work that um, you have been doing? Okay, well, there's a very long story and then there's a, a medium sized story. I'll try and not let it go on and on. But um, professionally speaking, I was a sports commentator for, well, I, I knew that's what I wanted to be from when I was six years old. And I got there. So having that focus, that narrow minded focus, that was the only thing I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I got there and was having great fun and was traveling around the world, commentating on tennis and, and football and other things. And I always had this nagging doubt in the back of my mind that I should actually be doing something to help people. And so 2015, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do something else. And then it was around that time that the whole situation with the refugee crisis really started kicking off. And uh, I was seeing these dinghies going across to Lesbos in Greece. And I decided to go over there and volunteer. And that was a turning point for me. I was only there for two weeks um, in a really disastrous situation. Uh, and I learned a lot. And I came back from there absolutely resolute to quit my career to start something that was going to help people. And it helped me realize that experience that I wanted to do something that was going to help bring people together to see each other as unique individuals and also to help those individuals get closer to achieving their personal goals, ideas, and ambitions. So I started something called Ambigo, which comes from Ambitions Go, because we help Ambitions Go places. So for the last three and a half years or so, we've been putting on events that are community networking events. So we bring people from different community groups, so a diverse bunch of people together in one space, not to uh, small talk with each other or to say, oh, let's look at the difference between us, but the opposite let's look at what each makes us individual. So everybody in the room, before they even say, hello, my name is, they don't even do that. We just say to them, now in your trios, explain what your goal, idea, or ambition is. And all these strangers in the room that have never met before and would never meet in normal circumstances, suddenly the noise goes up and up and up because they're talking about what they're passionate about and they're revealing what their values are. And then you forget about the other person's identity being about maybe the color of their skin or their age or the sexuality or their disability or any of those things. Really quickly, you're identifying with that person based on who they are inside, what their motivations are. And that's when we realize we've got more in common. And so, yeah, that's, that's what we've been doing for the last three and a half years in Brighton in the South of England, uh, amongst other things that I do, but, but that's the one that's been taking up most of my time. Look where you're going, look where you're going, because, you know, um, I know we've been having conversations, Adam, amongst ourselves in our community, the Global Challenges Retreat community that we're all a part of, um, particularly in the last um, 48 hours around this thing about how people who, uh, black and brown people, negotiate in spaces that are European dominated. Um, and uh, I, I think it was catalyzed with the George Floyd. Ah, um, yeah, 
murder that we all looked at, yeah? And uh, it was interesting that you said that, you know, very quickly we stop seeing, you know, what people look like on the outside when we connect with the underlying motivations. And, uh, you know, we're in a really difficult situation where what, I, what I'm seeing is that people are seeing our people are seeing black and brown people's colors threatening and negative and therefore reacting to them in that basis. And then there's another school of thought developing that the right way to approach this is to not see color and to look underneath to what the motivation is. And I'm wondering how you would uh, respond to those who are on the black and brown side receiving this uh, oppressive, let's say, uh, perception of self uh, projected onto them who say no, but you need to be able to do both. You need to be able to see my color, understand my color and also see our, and understand what that means in relationship with you, because it means something, and also see my underlying motivations and human, you know, drives. I wonder how you would respond to that. Mm, no, absolutely agree. It's both, and I think the the most important step is that understanding the need for that. Um, I was talking to some people yesterday about the fact that it feels like there's been some kind of imaginary threshold that has been reached in modern society, which says, because there is now legislative equality by and large. So for example, you know, in the most extreme situation, slavery has been abolished um, in its previous form. There are now different forms of it. And the, the laws might say that there is equality, but a lot of people, a lot of white people, don't recognize that there's, there's more than that. The, the perception is often, well, now we've got this equality, if you're still causing a fuss about it, you've got to get over it type thing. Um, so to bring it back to this, the, the issue of seeing both, seeing the inside and the outside and understanding what those mean, it, the first step there is helping the majority to understand the need to do that because if they don't see the need to do that it's not going to happen yeah. um, so that's that's a big step that I think we need to take and there are different ways of going about it and I'm I don't have the answers <laughs> but I think we're seeing a lot of change coming now what's happening now in the US feels different to yeah. what went on before yeah. Saw it in 2014 <coughs> after what happened in Ferguson. Yeah. Now though it feels like there's a more widespread groundswell. So Yeah, because I think you're seeing more allies um mm -hmm. coming out in the protests as well. Yes. And yes. so yeah, I, I I yeah, Adam, I think it's about how do we construct narratives that are able to that are inclusive and that the majority can see themselves in that narrative and can understand the role that they can play um, to, to, to bring about the shift. Because yeah, we have this legislative equality, but imposed on a space that was already unequal. And also, ha and, 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 and so therefore there, there appears to be legislative equality um, but at the end of the day, the people participating already are existing in a system that um, has the building in it. Legislation cannot force community. I, I like the fact, Adam, that you started with, um, you recognize that your first step in making a difference was the formation of a community. And um, I think that is probably where we're seeing the difference. Um, when, when Margaret, you talk about there more allies, I think it's because more people of um, diverse backgrounds are having real life interaction with each other. They're living together, um, intermarrying, um, working together, sharing the same kind of space.
to share experiences together um, and our Global Challenges community is very much like that. I, I met you, Adam, um, in 2018, you know, at, at, the, at the Global Challenges retreat and, and we had a chance to engage in a empathetic um, and it, it's, it, that is where I think it starts. Um, even um, because a, a lot of Asian Americans um, are also commenting about this because for a long time um, their parents and grandparents um, sort of set themselves apart um, and was they were very insular but they um, millennial Asian Americans and um, Gen Z Gen um, Asian Americans have been growing up among African Americans with hip hop culture, with you know the, the, the fashion and the style and integrating. So when Black Lives Matter happened, you know a few years ago, they were asking their parents, "Why aren't you supporting? Why aren't you supporting this? Why why are you? Why do you see yourself as apart from from these people?" Um, so community, it, it is all about seeing people as human and mixing with people. And the more segregated a society is, the more insular um, and, and divided a society is, no amount of legislation is going to be able to force people to, to get that human connection with each other. So I love the fact that you're on Beagle community. It, 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 the solution, Adam, started with community. Hmm. That is where it starts. Yeah, and it's also important to make it intergenerational as well we see you know in the uk there's a massive difference between the political views generally speaking of over 50s say as opposed to under 35s it's really stark if only under 25s had voted in the in the last election the conservative party would have barely won a seat in the entire country but instead they won a massive majority so it's also important to make sure that informing community it's not just with this the same the people who think the same as you and also not the people who look the same and also of the same age because we need to make sure that there is an empathetic bond between people of all different kind of backgrounds and all different ages without that people are going to get left behind and that sows the seeds of confusion misunderstanding and from misunderstanding becomes come begets it begets fear which begets hatred so that's something that I really try and cling on to as well with what I do. So you, pre you previously said that you were brought together into a room and you weren't really asked about your profession or your name and, you know, what do you bring to the table? You were actually asked what your motives are and what your objectives are. And now hearing about your community, could you like identify what are the, the objectives that you're looking for and how do you even form them? I mean, these are all so different people. How do we really form, find those consensus and then build on, the, on top of them? Well, what we do isn't trying to find consensus in terms of, say, community organizing. It's all about the individual. Mm -hmm. So when people are coming along to share their goals, ideas and ambitions, that's on a personal level. So it's everybody explain what their individual goals are. And so then there's the cross-pollination that happens. So... What happens is at a, a standard event that we do, not during lockdown, of course, is we bring 30 people there or thereabouts into a room. And uh, these are people that have come from different community groups. So, for example, we've worked with um, a group that helps people in recovery from addiction uh, and also people at the Black and Minority Ethnic Centre uh, in Brighton as well. And bring lots of different types of people together and we say to them, please sit with two people that you don't know. First of all, that you've never spoken to before. And people always do, I'm always surprised. At first, when, I, when we first started implementing that, we thought there'd be friction, you know, there'd be, but no, people are really compliant with that request. So uh, they do that and then they each have exactly the same amount of time to be heard about whatever it is that they want to talk about, whatever their goal is. So they talk for say four minutes each about their goal, why it's important to them, which is key and also what would help them to achieve it. And then after they've helped each other get that down on paper, they stick those sheets up around the room. Everybody goes around the room with post-it notes and they look at all these different ambitions that people have and they get inspired by what they're reading and what people want to do. 
And then as soon as you realize there's some kind of information, contact advice that you can offer, you jot it down on your post-it note and stick it on. It's really, really simple. And that's why it works. Um, and so you get all these post-it notes on your sheet and it's kind of semi-anonymous because the person whose sheet is isn't there holding it. So they are receiving this support uh, from people that are in the room that they wouldn't have necessarily received support from before. It gives you a massive boost of confidence. Um, and also what people, what draws people to the events is the selfish side. They're going, what can I get out of this? I've got this thing I really want to do. How can I achieve it? I want to get that support. But as soon as the event starts, everybody forgets about themselves. And instead they get lost in trying to help each other because we, we are naturally, we naturally get a kick. We get a dopamine hit out of helping somebody else. And so as soon as that activity begins, people are just trying to help each other, neglect themselves. Um, but you know, that's part of the beauty of it. And then we've not had an event so far where uh, nobody's been helped. And we've not had an event so far where somebody said, I didn't enjoy that. Everybody gets a real buzz about, out of all these strangers who they didn't even know existed two hours earlier, have come out to support them. So that's where the strengthening of community cohesion comes in because um, there's so many positive bonds formed very quickly and we don't have the science to back it up, but we just hope that that, um, that has a ripple effect outwards, that people are more inclined to ask for support from others, regardless of their background. Um, and also that they're, they're willing to be more open-minded to when they meet people who they perceive as different to them out, out of that environment. So yeah, we, we would love to have the resources and the time to work out if that is actually happening. We just hope it is. Yeah, that's really incredible. And, and it's so beautiful the way that you've, you know, aligned people's uh, internal motivations for, to help themselves with, a process which gives them an outlet to help others. I, that's it's really um, incredibly designed, I think, um, what you're talking about, those kinds of events. Um, I, I, I want for you know our viewers who are aspiring change makers, who have an idea that they want to bring out into the world, and they are looking at you and saying, wow, this is someone who you know decided to do something and made something happen. I'm wondering, um, what advice you could give to anyone starting out who has an idea about bringing about social change in their community, starting in, in some way, what kind of advice you could give them? What kind of challenges can they expect? And maybe what can they rely on? Uh, you, you know, what can they hold on to uh, through it all? Because you have been consistent and you've stuck with this. And I, I know we're going to talk about the other projects that you're doing now um, later on in this interview, but yeah. I don't know if you had any words of advice. Yeah, so there are two main things. One, and you won't be surprised to hear me say this, is just get that message out there to the universe about what it is you want to do. A lot of the time, people come to our events and on many occasions they're coming because they want to start some kind of community project or have some kind of social impact. And they've got this idea, but they've not really articulated it to anybody before. And so they don't think anyone's really going to help them. But as soon as they do, as soon as they get a bit of support and they're given a bit of confidence that actually their idea is pretty good and worth pursuing and exploring more, people come out of the woodwork to help. And we see it all of the time. Um, there was somebody in a, an event we did online a couple of weeks ago who was thinking about starting a project to support refugees um, through psychosocial support using yoga and meditation because this person had used those um, used those things to overcome her own PTSD. And she, know, she knows from her own experience of volunteering in Greece that she, she could see that there was a lot of residents of the camp she was working at who were suffering through trauma. And um, so she wanted to start this project and just hadn't really told anybody about it. And so it was like trying to research on the internet and not really getting anywhere. But as soon as she spread it out to the world, People come out of the woodwork. There's an organization that's based in Greece that have stepped up and said, actually, that would fit really well with what we're doing. Let's have a chat. And then it just blossoms. So get the message out to the universe in any way you can. And then secondly, 
if you are looking to start up some kind of project that needs to be financially sustainable, the first thing you've got to do, and it goes against all of your instincts as an empathetic person that wants to do social good, focus on the money. Please trust me on that one. It's caused no amount of stress <laughs> mm. because I went in with all the good intentions, spent all my savings on it. They ran out and then we still didn't have that financial stability. So what gave? It meant the other person I was working with didn't get to take any money from all his hard work. Um, or it felt dirty at first to concentrate on the money. No, I'm there for the social good. I want to help people. I want to help the planet. Yeah, we all do. That's why you're watching this. We all do. But unless you focus on the money, you're not going to have the sustainability to help anybody in the long term but or the short term. Because as long as you're worrying about that, then your energy is depleted. And without that energy, you can't do much good. So please focus on the money. And then the last thing you said was about... Um, uh, something alluding to like the support to keep you going. Yeah. Um, well, I've been very lucky to find uh, you, Sol, who have been a massive support to me. And uh, you will find your community. As, as long as you get the message out there, you will find communities, you will find your tribe that will support you. And it's so important to do that because you feel, you can feel very alone. If you're trying to set up a social impact project for the first time, there are so many highs and lows. It's so turbulent. There are so many occasions where you will probably think, I can't do this. But so many people have been through that before and they will help you through it. So again, just get the message out there. People will come out of the woodwork to support you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. We've recently gone through COVID. I just want to take a little switch. Jessica, Anya, you all could jump in. <laughs> right. I, I, I was about to make that switch too. Yeah. Because, um, um, one of have gotten as a takeaway from your experience um, working on the ground in the refugee camps um, in Greece, um, it was in Lesbos, <clears throat> in Lesbos in particular, was that when it came came to um, in the midst of a crisis that the people and community um, they were able to do that faster and with more effectiveness in addressing um, actual needs that people were having these ungainly large government um, and NGO organizations and international agencies they were sort of out of it and I could say, you know, it's the same thing with COVID in my little, little small island that I live in. Um, the, the, the communities um, on the ground quickly were able to just get things organized. Um, I, I, I have food, you know, I farm, I can provide this, you know, um, I could sow. Oh, I could make um, people when given the chance to act um, in the interests of others and the other communities, they do think they get things done faster than a lot of these ungainly organizations. So I just wanted to see, um, hear from you, you know, a little bit more, how that applies to COVID going forward. In terms of what I'm doing? In terms of what you're doing and, and in terms of what you have observed. Um, well, what I've observed, I, yeah, I've really um, had really close first-hand experience of when regular people step into the void. So I volunteered in Lesbos in 2015 and then I went back there in October and November last year and uh, it, it was complete transformation. So the situation had got a lot worse in some respects because the numbers of people essentially trapped and imprisoned in many regards in, in these camps um, had ballooned from around 1,000 when I went before, up to 17, 18, 19, 20,000 in a camp that set up for 3,000. So in, in, in that respect, it got a lot worse and conditions have been and still are really bleak for people. Um, but then on the other hand, the response from regular people has been phenomenal. So when I went before, I was there on my own, 
pair of hands, sometimes with just one other person working through the night, deciding who was going to get a tent to stay in after fleeing for three weeks from war and who was going to have to sleep in the mud in two degree heat. This time when I went back in 2019, it, there was a whole structured operation. Um, the, the land had been leveled, so it was flat so that they could have uh, tents put up and everybody was in tents. I mean, the conditions were still awful, tragically awful, but there was community. And that's because an NGO had stepped up, which has put the residents of the camps, and they call them residents rather than refugees, in positions of power. And they lead on the tasks. And so if there's waste management these, that needs to be done, then the residents of the camp themselves are stepping up and saying, okay, I'll coordinate this. And these are people from very different backgrounds, you know, because often we can think that refugees, let's put them in that box. That's lunacy to do that because you've got people from so many different countries, so many different cultures and languages. But in Lesbos at the moment, they're working together through this uh, organization in particular that I worked with called Movement on the Ground. And um, yeah, the camp uh, manager for the Olive Grove, as it's called, at the main camp, is somebody who went through that camp himself as a refugee from Syria when he was just 18, uh, five years ago. So he's now 23 and he's managing the situation. Um, and this is what happens when regular people get together, organize and, and mobilize themselves in order to set up some kind of structure. And that was because the major charities were almost nowhere to be seen. So little being done from the big names you can think of. Um, and the regional and national governments were trying to be as hands-off as possible. They didn't want to be spending their resources on it. Um, it's a very complex situation, so I'm not going to start apportioning blame. Um, but it's been beautiful to see that reaction from the grassroots upwards. And also what's important is that they are doing it um, with constant communication with the local authorities and national authorities as well. They're always willing to show government ministers around uh, from different countries, not just Greece, because they want to work with them, not against them. Confrontation helps nobody. And it's the same with the police locally as well. So there's a great deal of respect between them. Uh, and that has been so vital. And it's going to be so more going forwards because the plans have been to close down these camps and set up new detention centers as well, where there'll be very limited movement rights for the residents. So there are a lot of uncertain times to come. So being responsive on the ground and, and having those good relationships with the state and the authorities is yeah so important. So having these good relationships, I mean, what I'm seeing quite often is that we um, know who's getting the money and we hear that certain ministries have shown up and you know that there is a dialogue between the refugees and whomever is on the ground with whomever is the authority in certain place but what we don't really get the information about is what is it that happens what is it that the dialogue stands for and I have a feeling that you can actually provide us with some very insightful information about what is it the resources or is it the money or right now you actually told us that there is a bunch of facilitators or people that are supporting the um, grassroots governance almost like people are actually taking ownership of certain tasks that need to be done so that we act in a civilized manner or so that we actually know how to cooperate together but can you elaborate a bit more about what is it that happens when this cooperation happens Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not party to the conversations themselves between the, the leaders of the NGOs and the local government or local authorities, um, but I see the effects of it. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is to do with the land. So the actual official, the largest camp, the largest refugee camp in Europe is on the Greek island of Lesbos, and that's called Moria. And the official camp only has capacity for 3,000. And outside of that, it's called the Olive Grove, where the vast majority of the refugees are having to live. And these NGOs, having had those conversations and come to agreements with the local authorities, they have been given control of that land. So the local authorities have said, okay, you NGO that didn't exist more than three years ago, you are in charge of this land and everything that happens on it. So you set up the food provision, you sort out the uh, sanitation, um, 
and waste management and the organization of who actually lives where and so by that i mean where do the tents go uh, how everything is structured so and that has such a huge knock-on effect um mm -hmm. also with the food provision they have to work with the local authorities because the local authorities are deciding which catering companies get the contracts and those kinds of things and then that catering company then uh, works with um some people from the military as well have been there um kind of just overseeing things but they're working with residents of the camp through the ngo in order to make sure that people are fed and they've got such an effective system we've seen it countless times before when you open a food van there's a huge crush it's completely undignified some people get a lot and so many people go without the most vulnerable but there's such a structured system here input by uh, implemented by the ngo after they've worked out the best way to do it with the local authorities that every single person it's designed will receive exactly the same amount of food so it, it, it's not going to be perfect but it's the best solution that I could imagine and they're doing it so effectively as well. Uh, this almost sounds like um, uh, ad hoc, minimum viable urbanism and agriculture um, mm. project that really happens just for a um, certain amount of time, um, just to solve the crisis and might even stay there, might even become something um, on a long term. But is that something that your project is also about? What my, how is your, yeah, how is your project integrated into all these work and all these solution solutions that we have just addressed? Um, I've never really um, thought about it in deep connection because uh, what I do in England has kind of been one response to a problem that I saw when I first went to Lesbos in 2015, uh, which was the lack of cohesion back home because we've seen the borders go up throughout europe since 2015 to these people that are coming over through this fear fear of the other they're going to come here they're going to take our jobs blah 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 blah. and so what i wanted to do where i felt my skill set was best suited rather than being on the ground and volunteering until i ran out of money and that was no use to anybody i wanted to do something back home that was going to strengthen that cohesion so that, that's the link I saw between my project in Brighton and what I was doing over there in Greece. Cool. Cool. And I want to take you back to um, Vigo, um, Adam. Uh, we just went through COVID. <laughs> I say went through as if it's past tense. We're still going through it. But how has COVID, because Ambigo is about putting on events and bringing people together and all that stuff. So how has COVID impacted your work in Ambigo? Yeah, well, like most people, we've had to innovate. So we've taken our events online. So they're very different. And um, I'd say they're more effective in the sense of helping people achieve their ambitions. but perhaps at the moment anyway, less effective in strengthening community cohesion. Right. And I say that because what we're doing now is we, we can't have an event with 30 people. And because it's a, a publicly broadcast event, um, we use a platform called StreamYard. Um, it's going out on Facebook Live and YouTube. We're not getting people that aren't extroverted, basically. And so we're getting the people that already feel confident about their idea and confident to be vulnerable, you know, okay. because talking about your personal goals, ideas, and ambitions is quite an intimate thing. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's a big ask of people. And we often work with marginalized people, vulnerable people. And so they're not, they're not coming on board for this. Yeah. So we're still trying to work that out. So what we're actually doing in real terms is we're doing basically like a TV show. So, we have six people that come on and they we have a chat with them and I ask them what is their goal, why it's important to them and what would help them achieve it. And we just chat for 10 to 15 minutes around loosely around those three questions and then put that ask out there to the universe, to the people watching. Um, is there a way you can support them? And so it's effective in helping them achieve their ambitions because it's going out to the world. So it's reaching more people, not just 30 people in one room. 
Um, so that's the positive. But um, my greatest aim, my core will, is more the strengthening commu community cohesion part. At the moment, these events are, are more, you know, being really candid here, are kind of really catered towards uh, the people who are already in a position of privilege. Mm. So there's still something to work out there. I mean, ideally, we'd get back to normal. Um, but that's not going to happen. So we've got to continue to innovate. And, and maybe I could throw in a little ambigo approach here. How can, you know, uh, others, people watching and us, how can we help you um, do those events better or, or help you with your innovation? How can people help you? Mm. Um, ideas, first of all, because I'm not going to profess to be an expert in doing online events. Um, I wasn't an expert in doing any events until I just started doing it. Uh, so if anybody does have knowledge out there of how to run online events that attract a diverse audience or a diverse participatory group, then I would love to speak to you about that. Uh, and also partners. So we do most of our events in partnerships with other groups. Um, you know, that's a way we're trying to make sure that we're we're allowing everybody's voice to be heard, no matter their background. So for example, yesterday we did an event um, in partnership with a, a mental health organization and uh, we're doing one with a learning disability charity next week as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the week after that, a group that's um, helping people in recovery as well. So we want to have more partnerships with groups who represent people from all different kinds of backgrounds. It can be anything. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to partner with us, then let us know as well. Yeah, I just, I know, sorry, it's just the things that you say are stimulating stuff for me. So I'm just, I just want to know, um, you know, you've gone to StreamYard where you're, you know, streaming these events now live um, on these platforms, but that, as you indicated, seems to be inimical to the kind of intimacy that you used to create at your events, which allowed people to show up. Mm -hmm. more authentically and maybe with more courage um so why did you make the shift to doing online events in that way like broadcasting it because couldn't you do intimate online events as well where people could just come and it's not broadcast so absolutely in an ideal world we would the reason we've not done that is simply numbers now with our regular events people and this is partly our fault for not being good enough at communicating what we do, but we've been at it for three and a half years and we've still not found the right way to communicate in, in that it would make people understand it because nothing like it exists. That's right. We say fun community networking events, but still people don't really get what that is. They often think it's something to do with business and it can be, but it can also just be about your ambition being to be more courageous, for example. So with our in-person events, we often tie them to other things so for example we do an event called the international feast which i love which is where everybody brings along their own favorite dish so they make their own favorite dish to bring and share it's a potluck event so people come for that oh gonna experience food from all these different places brings in people whose roots are all over the world into the same space and then we go surprise we're doing this goals idea and ambitions thing well we, it's not a surprise <laughs> we do communicate that beforehand but they're not thinking about it yeah. And then when the event starts and they start doing that, that's the bit they love and they want to do more of. And it creates such a nice atmosphere in the room when somebody stands up and says, I want to do this. Now, at our live events, we don't, not everybody has to do that. We really respect that some people don't want to say anything in front of the big group. So um, that's making it optional means that it's inclusive. But with our current events, we've got no choice but for you to you know, do it focally although we do accept written ambitions as well that we, that we communicate. Um, so maybe that's something else for us to look at. You know, what is the substitute for that thing yeah. that can draw people in? So we often tie our events into large occasions as well. So, so like we did an event for Chinese New Year, for example. And so people come to experience this Chinese food, authentic handmade, homemade Chinese food, and, and then stay for the ambition stuff. Uh, so that's why we've not done the same kind of thing online simply because we've not been able to get the numbers in without, you know, without doing it the way we are doing. Yeah, and you, you touched on something I think that's so important 
um, for entrepreneurs and in particular social entrepreneurs have to be thinking about because a lot of times social entrepreneurs are doing things that have never been done before because you've come up with an idea and all that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And, it, and it's, a, it's a big challenge, I think, when you don't have a roadmap uh, or a blueprint to follow because your mm -hmm. idea is so unique um, to be able to learn and understand how to construct the right messaging and the right narrative so that people you know, understand what they're getting and all of that. And I think you all kind of hit upon it in how you all approached it uh, by giving people what they wanted, right? And, and understanding them first, what do they want? What is gonna drive them? What's gonna motivate them that it's aligned to what I do? And you give them that, and then when they come in, you, you know, of course, you, with integrity, you've showed them before what they're gonna get as well, but you really hit them with the stuff that you know, you analyze the problem space, and you've come up with your solution, and you give them the solution packaged in what they want. So I, I think that's brilliant. And I just wanted to pull that out and articulate that from your story, because I think that's a real great nugget for mm -hmm. social entrepreneurs listening to your story and how you were able to do what you had to do. Yeah, but COVID impacted you in a, in a very real and significant way as a social entrepreneur as well, outside of Ambigo. You, you were moved to do a lot more, Adam. Share with us about the project that you're working, that you, that just came out of COVID and just blew up, you know, to be a transnational project with yeah. from all over um, the world. And, and yeah, share a little bit of us on that project. At the end of March or start of April, uh, that's, we were a week into lockdown here in the UK. And what everybody was talking about at that moment was PPE, personal protective equipment. I listened to a radio interview with a nurse in a hospital who was saying that she wasn't being given adequate personal protective equipment. And in fact, the guidelines had been written to suggest she didn't need it, even though she had people with COVID symptoms coughing in her face. And I was livid. <laughs> How? This is the UK. How are we allowing this to happen? Uh, and so I put out a call on the Internet just saying, OK, this is happening. Doing something about it. Don't know what. Give me your ideas. And so people threw ideas and then gradually we started to realize that what was missing, what the, what the lack was, was a coordinated um, notice board, basically, of what's happening in the community regards making PPE. So there were people in the community making masks here and people making scrubs there and people sewing masks there. But... If you were working in a care home, say, you're a manager of a care home and your staff have got no PPE and you need to get gloves, masks and, and scrubs or whatever it, whatever it is that you need, you haven't got the time to be trying to search around all these different places only to find that they've run out. You need to have information there on a plate ready to give to you. So what we did, me and a friend, was start something called the PPE Maker Network. So ppemaker.net is the website. And it's very simply a map where people plot if they need PPE on there and they say where they are and what they need. And if you are able to help supply that, you say what you can supply where you are and, and give more details. Um, and so now we've just started recruiting, as it were, local coordinators. So what we were finding was that people were putting themselves on the map in great numbers, but then not looking at it again because they're too busy. And so there were all these people on the map, but nobody communicating with each other. So it was a bit pointless. So instead, we're, we're asking people to help out if they can act as a proactive member of their local community to make the connections between using the map, making the connections between the people who need the PPE and the people who can supply it. So, yeah, it was just me and a friend to begin with. And we got the word out there, like I was saying earlier, just tell the universe and it will respond. And we grew to Take a action. team of 13. Yeah. So we had somebody in Thailand building the website and somebody in France doing the kind of um, internal team structure kind of thing, making sure we were clear on our vision, our values and our core aims and those kinds of things. And um, several other people in the UK and somebody in the US who's still working with us as well. Um, so yeah, that, that escalated really quickly internally. Um, and it's been quite a challenge to find the time on top of trying to run a business that's going through the COVID-19 stuff and a couple of other projects as well. So it's been very challenging, but gratifying 
when a connection is made where people are actually helping each other get PPE to who needs it because who knows what kind of impact that could have you know it could save lives so you know if you're watching this and you know somebody out there who can supply PPE or who needs it make sure they're on the map at ppemaker.net thanks for the plug ppemaker.net we're going to put a little ticker to that <laughs> down at the bottom Adam what drives you what yeah what drives you to create these projects and, and to do all the stuff that you're doing in the world my core will is to power love to others and between others so a lot of introspection led to that to power love to others and between others and it's dangerous having that as your core aim because that can incorporate so much uh, as you know, I'm a very empathetic person. I was described as having empathy as my superpower by um, by somebody who was coaching me a few years ago. And uh, if that's not channeled properly, it can feel like a burden because you're constantly throwing your emotional energy out there um, and there's not the right balance. Um, so that's what powers me. It's just this burning desire to make sure that there's equality and everybody feels valued for who they are. Um, and it doesn't just extend to people, but the planet, animals as well. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I just feel kind of duty like bound you. to do stuff. So, and it's great to know that when I come across people like you, um, who are out there, that I'm not the only one who feels driven by empathy to, to make an impact to make changes in the world um, because sometimes you know before I come across a tribe like this um, that can help support me and I can help support them it can feel like you're alone and that's when fatalism sets in and everything becomes too much and I've been through those periods uh, and uh, yeah I don't think you you, you quite um, release yourself from those shackles of fatalism entirely we've got to follow this dual path as Matt McCartney would say uh -huh. um, twin path. So, twin path. Sorry, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that's what drives me, I suppose. Uh, that and just, I suppose, what's been pointed out to me recently is that I have some kind of ability to just start things, whereas other people would think about things and not do them. I'm really good at starting things. You're a catalyst. I'm not so good at the continuation. Catalyst. You're a <laughs> catalyst. catalyst. Yeah. We are kindred there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> you and I. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm very much catalyst, a, a high degree of intuit, the strategy yeah. side not we, so much. We we'll, we'll put a link to the to the power archetypes in case any viewers don't know what what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. In the retreat community, we we identify ourselves. We're able to see what our superpowers are, and so Adam's yeah. superpower is intuit catalyst. You know, a, a strong sense of. Of, of what needs to happen, a visionary, you know, coming out of your intuit and then the courage and the ability to take action catalyst. And some people are just really powerful thinkers. And then there are people who are strategist catalysts, like Anya is a strategist catalyst. So she will speak about something really the antique action, right? And then there's some intuit catalysts um, who feel really deeply and, you know, deep strategy, but you know, they don't take the action and, and all of that, but it's exciting. Margaret, to, yeah. can I, you've just reminded me of something when you asked about advice around starting a social impact project. Yeah. Uh, a third thing has just cropped up in my mind related to this, and it's about forming a team. It's so crucial in the early stages to yeah. make sure that you are getting people that you are as confident as you can possibly be is the right person or are the right people to be in your team Absolutely. do they share your vision and for the right reasons do they share your burning passion as well and do they have a complementary skill set so looking at these archetypes is a one way and one probably mm -hmm. way i'd recommend as well to look at that um because i've made the mistake before and in getting in somebody into the project because they said they wanted to and i went yeah, oh, wow that's great somebody wants to come on board oh, you know and i was so naive at the start of it <laughs> uh -huh. and and then realized actually they're just far too similar to me and that's not good 
<laughs> you but it's not that it's no answer. good. It's not that it's no good, but it would be good to have people who are strong yeah. where you're weak. Yeah, yeah, but it just means that there's a big hole still yeah. in yeah. in your team. You know, there's a massive skill set that's lacking if, if you're just bringing on people who are the same as you in, in terms of what they can bring. So, yeah, sorry, just wanted to throw that in after you reminded me. Yeah, man, yeah, man. That, and, that, and that's certainly, I think, where the intuitive structures catalyst uh, archetype framework actually helps. Um, to position and from the time we started embodying that um, in a real way in you solve we saw things really start to flow and change um, and then yeah that's good good stuff but um right <laughs> I've, I'm I am I am I'm very satisfied with, with everything said so far well okay diversity is needed in order for us to solve these issues of all the isms, the racism, and the, you know, the, the, all the phobias as well. Um, we need people to come together. And what I find is that diversity is often forced. It's not, or it's contrived, or, and it doesn't feel real. But oh, the way that you're diversity. going about it, Adam, it's more organic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. To the point where people often have a negative reaction when you're talking about diversity. They're like, ugh, you know, it's this you know, contrived tokenism thing, you know, but um, how do you make it authentic, Adam? One, how do you make it authentic and how do you help it to strengthen rather than weaken the community? What we do is something called risotto meetups. And this comes from when I started the whole thing back at the end of 2016, um, so I, I just worked for nine months solid to build up a financial buffer to help me do this. And then I said, okay, right. I've just, I've just come back from a trip to Tokyo working on a tennis tournament, came back the following Monday. It was right. Okay. I'm now no longer a sports journalist. And so I'd already put on a couple of trial events, trial Ambigo events, and they'd worked extraordinarily well. And so I invited people back who had participated in those events into my new living room. I'd just moved into a new flat with three housemates and, and they were like, what the hell is this? There are 12 strangers sat on the floor in a circle, cross-legged, <laughs> eating risotto. But that's what I did. I cooked them risotto and said, well, these are my ideas. These are my plans. Can you help me with it? So we've just continued doing that because that was really valuable. Because I was just honest from the start and said, I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm a sports journalist. I don't know anything about running events. I don't know anything about social enterprises or anything. And they help fill in the gaps. And when you are honest and vulnerable, people will step in. People relate to that and people want to help. Absolutely. So that was really nice. So we've just continued that all the way through. So they're never the same people that come. Um, not entirely the same people anyway. So as our events have gone on and we've been able to bring in people from all different kinds of backgrounds, they're coming to these risotto meetups where I continually ask, how can we do this better? How would it best serve uh, the most diverse range of participants possible? How can we reach into these different geographical areas that we don't seem to be attracting anybody from? Um, so when you're filling out funding applications, there's this question, which is how have you um, used community in designing your offering? And they put that question in there for a really good reason. And it's what you were talking about, Jessica, about how sometimes it can feel contrived or imposed. And it's, I'm really glad that the funders are asking that question to make the organizations think about that. Um, so it's always been from the bottom up. So it's anarchic. Yeah, it, it's never, okay, we're going to do this now. <laughs> it, we're going to do this now. And you, you uh, this type of person here, are going to come face to face with this person here and you're going to get on. It's, it's about using the learning and the feedback and the wishes of the people that we're trying to serve in order to um, to inform what we actually, actually deliver at our events. So you can only make it authentic if it's being powered and the ideas are coming from the people that you're trying to benefit. If not, then it's a, an imposition. I like that. The ideas have to come from the people you're trying to benefit. Mm. Yeah. And risotto. And resourceful. 
And you're just it's making me hungry. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know, God. Yeah, everything to seems to revolve around food, I'm starting to realize. Yeah. 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 Food brings everybody together. Yeah, yeah it's an important element. I mean, even the business meetings are happening quite often over a lunch or a dinner. Apparently, the appetite and uh, just the feeling itself triggers some of the satisf satisfaction uh, yeah. in the body and makes you um, more aligned with whatever people are suggesting around you. So mm -hmm. you're pretty much going to say yes much more often. It even was like, what was it? A research? People were actually um, finding a correlation between judges and how they actually um, declared their judgment whether a person is going to go to the prison or not. And after lunch, apparently they were much more like, you know, going with the notion of, yeah, let's leave it outside. Let's not put that person into the prison and stuff like that. So it plays a huge role on how Which we Which is are, kind of scary. In it a way. is, but at the same time, being a strategic, having a strategic mindset, if you want somebody to actually say yes to what you're offering, then make that meeting after lunch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, a, a we use in, in marketing and advertising when we invite a client yeah. in, you, we feed them, you, you, you take them out to lunch, you, you, you wind them, dine them. <laughs> Anytime you have meetings, you make sure you have coffee and refreshment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now with COVID so and fun. everything going virtual. Yes, yes. We, we lose one That's of it, because it's a, it's a beautiful shared experience, isn't it? And when you are sharing food together, you're starting from the base point of something we have in common. Mm -hmm. This shared experience of the food. Yeah. Uh, and ostensibly, it's, the focus is on the food, but it's not. It's on the relationship between the people who are sharing the food. And, um, you know, just a, a little trick that you can do in a setting if there's conflict going on, you make sure that you only have uh, one ladle or whatever it is that you need, one serving yeah. implement for the food. So that somebody is serving other people. So bonds of trust are being formed between the different people, um, you know, mm -hmm. rather than serving everybody's food on a plate ready for them. So, you know, you learn these little things. Interesting. Too. Interesting. There was a city that um, was trying to encourage a lot more um, socialization and, and intermingling. And they had this program where they got bars to deliberately mix up people's drink orders and food orders. So you, you, you know, you were forced to go, oh no, you have my sandwich or you have my drink and exchange injured and to interact with each other. So yeah. yeah. You will have to in innovate new ways of doing that virtually and online um, if this COVID thing continues for months or if a new epidemic comes around that has the same social distancing, physical distancing effect. <laughs> <laughs> don't want any when, more. <laughs> when you just mentioned Jessica a new pandemic or perhaps a new wave um, there is also something that you're doing with regard to COVID or maybe even a bit of a broader right. idea Adam yeah much broader um, would you be willing to talk and take us through the documentary idea that you have I mean Margaret previously said that it's very important for us to create new narratives and what we do what are the reasons why we do everything that we are, you know, forced into just because we feel empathic or whatever it is. And it is about how we document these things as well. So please do tell us what it is that you do and how. This new exciting it. project that, that we are going to reveal for the first time. Live yeah. today to those who listen to the show. Okay, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> so, because I thought the one thing in the world I don't have enough of is projects, I decided after coming back from Lesbos, I thought there has been so much learning. Because when I went in 2015, it was four years before I went the second time, it, the difference was so stark for me from when I was there before and there was almost nothing in terms of official setup. And now it was being run like clockwork. I realized that there was so much grassroots learning there about how to respond to a crisis in an empowering, dignifying, and effective way. And I came back from that thinking, hmm, okay. And then I was harking back to my journalism days and thinking, oh, there's an idea brewing here. I want to take this learning and 
disseminate it wider so that others in their local areas feel empowered and prepared to deal with whatever crisis might land on their doorstep. Um, so this idea has developed from looking not only at the Greek refugee crisis situation, but also at other crises that have happened in recent times. So um, most specifically in the research phase at the moment, looking at things like the Ebola crisis, um, because th that was grassroots, but in a very different way, because there were large charities there that were connecting with people at the grassroots level to inform the community, to have um, community educators going around and telling people about what the disease was and or is and also how to combat it. Uh, also Hurricane Harvey in the US because there was a huge grassroots response there with some 5,000 rescues taking place from people from across the USA who got their fishing boats, put it on the back of their, their truck, took it to where it was needed and then as soon as the Coast Guard said yes you can go, they just got out on their fishing boats um, and went to where they were being told on their phones by people who were coordinating the thing, again grassroots on their phones, finding out on the ground who was in trouble, who was waiting on their roof to be rescued, and all these regular people were going out there to go and pick these people up and save their lives. Um, so there's so much learning, and so we want to get that out there, because we kind of feel like at the moment, like, oh, we're going through a tough period. This feels like just the beginning, with the climate crisis to come, and all of the social issues that we've got going on that are going to be worsened as well potentially by the climate crisis and so much else. Um, I think everybody's kind of aware. Um, there are going to be more crises, that's inevitable. So how can we help empower people to feel prepared to be able to collaborate with others from a grassroots level? And then after I brought this idea to you and, a, and two filmmakers who are absolutely amazing, Leslie and Rob, um, ideas started to blossom and then and you were like hmm what's the kind of digital technology in this and I was like yeah so from my experience like digital technology is huge and then you were coming up with ideas around that and then Margaret was like well what about the relationship with policy makers surely that's crucial I'm like yeah that's obviously like a huge part so now now this thing has blossomed and like Margaret you were saying before about it would be fantastic if we could actually at the end of this work towards um, developing some kind of actual tool that we can give people so that they can go on and do it. So we don't just show it, we give them something to enable them to actually put it into practice when they need it the most. So yeah, just in the research phase at the moment, very excited with COVID and everything, you know, there are huge question marks about how we're gonna be able to uh, get the resources for this, but we can make it happen if the world's there. So very excited. Any ask around that? Any ask? A lot. Um, so we are looking at the Greek refugee crisis, currently the Jakarta floods, which are happening very frequently, most recently at the start of this year, Ebola uh, and Hurricane Harvey, and then COVID. So if anybody out there has any kind of experience of grassroots response to those crises, or you know somebody that might have, please put them in contact with us. Uh, because we want to learn from them, first of all, and then who knows potentially with a view to actually including them in the documentary. Um, and also, if you are from, let's say, a research body, um, maybe you're from a department studies um, faculty of, a, of an academic institution, and you're thinking this is something that could help us, you know, there, there's learning out there uh, at a grassroots level that we don't know about that could be useful and feels pertinent going forwards, and you would like to support us to do it, again, we want to speak to you as well. And maybe you've got your own asks that you're thinking of as well. No, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. Yeah, what we are going to do on our end, because, you know, Future Law is very excited to partner with you media and yourself uh, with this documentary. And so we have lawyers from all over the world who are coming together. We've now crossed over 130 lawyers and systems thinkers coming together to, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I know, crazy, crazy. <laughs> and we started at the end of March as well, um, who are mapping 
uh, what governments are doing in response to COVID-19 and so that we can, you know, get learnings together about what is going on in the world so that we can be more effective for uh, uh, future crises, which, you know, from all people who are looking at future trends, futurists, whether they're legal futurists or another futurist, it is clear that this is not going to be the last one uh, for the next 50 or 100 years. It seems that this may be catalyzing a whole new period of transnational crises. And so we're coming together to do that. And so one of the things, um, if we have any of our lawyers looking at this conversation today um, from all over the world, if you have knowledge of uh, policy responses in those particular crises that Adam has identified. Um, so it was, it's the Greek refugee crisis, it's the Jakarta yes. floods, uh, it's the, what's the, what's the, Ebola. Ebola. Right. And, and Hurricane, Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey. Um, that's the US. Uh, so any of our lawyers in any of those teams, we know we have lawyers on the African continent and in the US. And um, in, we have a, one in Greece, actually. Just one mm -hmm. from Greece. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it would be great if we, uh, or if you're not even part of our network, anyone out there as well who understood the response of the government in the midst of those crises, we are trying to collect that information as well, because we're really trying to unpack um, how uh, all the players, all the players, relevant players in society respond um, in times of crises and trying to map in fact those responses and seeing what are the relationships that worked and what were the relationships that didn't, you know, and what, yeah, and the things that we get together, so yeah. Can I add as well that uh, because we're in the research phase at the moment, what is um, most important is that we're focusing on areas where there was um, a, a real clear grassroots response to the crisis. So we're not rigid at the moment, we're still at the early stage um, where we're open to looking at different crises that we may not right. have already considered. So if you are in an area of the world where you go, well, there's great grassroots response to whatever, then let us know about that as well, because we'll want to look at it. So, yeah, we've still got flexibility at the moment. Cool, cool, cool. Great. This is good. Adam, this was fantastic. Um, and, and the amazing thing is um, with each of the experts we have in this, in this conversation you know what it is we need to stop doing what it is we need to keep doing and what it is we need to start doing and you answer all those questions in the in the midst of in, of the conversation so i we can't even ask you that because you were so <laughs> rich and and thought wonderful it was wonderful to, to talk to you yeah thank you so much adam great great conversation um please give us all the links to the various projects um, and contact email for you um, that we will put under this video when we publish this video um, and so that people can know exactly how to get in contact with you with any one of the projects, Ambigo, the PPE project, the documentary film project. Um, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Mm -hmm.